This episode of Serverless Chats is sponsored by New Relic. This week, I chat with Nika Fee about the New Relic One platform. This is Serverless Chats, episode number 62. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Daly, and this is Serverless Chats. Today, I'm speaking with Nika Fee. Hey, Nika, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. Long time fan, so it's great to be on. Well, thank you. So you are a developer advocate at New Relic, and I'd love it if you could tell the listeners a bit about your background and what led you to New Relic and you know, sort of what's new with New Relic. Sure, yeah, that's great. I was actually at New Relic back in the day. I was, I was at New Relic as a support engineer until about 2015, I believe, and uh, left to go and become a full-time developer and full-time coder. And my path took me back sort of as I, as I was sort of coding full time and, and just, you know, clearing, clearing queues and writing features and fixing bugs, I really started to miss some of the community building that I'd done previously, um, especially actually when I was at New Relic back in the day, you know, I was one of the people who was starting meetups and doing that kind of community building. And so I started to try to pursue that as a, as a bigger job, job, which is how I got into dev advocacy. Dev advocacy, you know, you get to tinker and you get to play and build stuff. Um, and you also get to like try to get other people excited about it and try to show it to people. So I was doing that for Stackery, which is a, a, a serverless deployment tool um, for two years and had some success there and built some skills and, and really enjoyed it. And that's where I got kind of very into AWS and cloud engineering. So uh, yeah, now I'm, back at, now I'm back at New Relic and um, it's such an interesting time. It's such an interesting time to be at New Relic and uh, be looking at you know how we can go and talk to developers. Um, something that uh, you know is interesting about being here is that everybody is talking about the time I was last here. Everybody's talking about you know, hey, there was a time when New Relic was something that you know lone engineers would install on one server, mm -hmm. and they, and something would go down. They'd be like, well, I can see right here what the problem is, and then and then some exec was saying, hey, let's let's go use this tool. It sounds great, you know. And right now, the, 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 the question is, can we get back there? Right. <laughs> can we get back to the place where it's a tool that developers love and that they're the ones saying, hey, we got to use this rather than, you know, as, as are so many developer tools being something where, you know, most people know it from the CTO coming in and being like, we're using this tool. You know, I met this guy in the golf course. He's told me great things about it. It's got a great spec sheet. We're using it. Everybody's going to use it now. Right. So <laughs> the question is, can we get back there to being to being in that space? And that's that's sort of what I'm doing for New Relic. I'm trying to go talk to talk to actual engineers about what it does and, and how it can help them. Awesome. Well, I mean, one thing about New Relic is that they just released the New Relic One platform. Uh, yeah. I want to say the new New Relic One platform, but yeah. it seems kind of hard to say new twice. Uh, but uh, first of all, I, I like also we do that every year. We should do new, you know New Relic, <laughs> but then a starburst at the side. It's new this time. <laughs> it's it's new, even newer. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank New Relic because they are sponsoring this episode, um, which is amazing. Which again shows their uh, incredible amount of support towards the community uh, as well. So I do think that uh, uh, this is a great well, opportunity. A shout, shout out on on that one, actually. Absolutely. Um, you know, as a, as a dev advocate, you know, I, I am actually really actively looking for stuff that is exciting in the community that we can help support. And so, you know, I, obviously, you know, you were very high on my list. I said, hey, we got to do this. But I don't see everyone. I don't know everything. So if, 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 you're, if you're listening to this and you have either an open source project on observability or you're doing uh, community events or running a podcast that maybe is a, a little less famous than this guy, um, <laughs> get in touch with me. Hit me up on Twitter. Sh show me your stuff. I would love to hear about it. My situation right now is I don't know enough people to support. Not that I can't do that. So yeah, I, 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 I want to hear from y'all if, if possible. Well, that's awesome. That's a great, that's a great offer. And anyone listening, please, uh, 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 take up that offer because I think it could be quite amazing. Um, yeah, so anyway, so you can keep expensing uh, GitHub sponsorships, but for, for the moment, that's just what I'm doing. just like, well, let's just do it. And I'll just I'll just fight with AR after after we get it done. And I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, not at all. I, I appreciate that. Um, all right. So let's get back to New Relic for a second. And this New Relic One platform, I do want to go through mm -hmm. this because it, it it is 
actually pretty cool. I mean, the entire thing has been completely rewritten. Um, it's like it's all new, right? It's like the not all rewritten. I shouldn't say it that way. Yeah, but- I I had I had hopped into so I came on five months ago now, and I got into New Relic, and I, I had kind of you know it was like I, I I was excited. There was obviously tons of new stuff since I'd last you know been there five years ago. Um, uh, but the, I was like a little confused. There was some stuff that looked the same as what I'd seen five years ago. And there was other stuff that was like, oh, this is kind of a n- nice little interface. And and there were things like um, in this new interface, which was sort of part of the site at the time, you could do stuff like every chart, you could go see like, what is the actual query that's building this chart? Mm-hmm. You could go and like, oh, like edit it. it. You could go and facet it. And you can make it more sophisticated, save it out. Oh, it was really neat. But that was only kind of part of the site. And you know, it was like, hey, this doesn't feel 100% cohesive. I'm like, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm not trained or something. But what what's been happening and what's 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 been released in the last few weeks is the whole site is the same, very clean, cohesive experience now. So that you can do stuff like if you're monitoring on AWS Lambda and you're maybe monitoring some other service, maybe something that's even self-hosted, mm-hmm. but their performance is implicitly connected, you can tie them together very easily. You can even just rewrite the query to connect them both directly. Or like I was just writing something that's um, just trying to do your own kind of basic cost uh, estimation. Yeah. that just applies its own like rate of, of like, hey, you know, we know for a Lambda how much does it cost per request, but maybe for your self-hosted stuff, that has a certain cost per, per usage. And so ties them together and gives you a nice like price dashboard just kind of out of thin air like that was that's pretty nice yeah. yeah so yeah that's that's the new relic one platform which you know we're working on dark mode but right now it has a lot of quality of life improvements for developers so so we're enjoying that yeah, and I think that you know, if, if people don't know, I mean, New Relic. I always remember New Relic as being, you know, APMs and and you know, monitoring and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the buzzword of observability is the newer yeah. sort of uh, thing. So maybe we take a step back and and just in case people don't know, like what what is observability? Like how how do you define observability? Yeah, this is this is a really good one. Is that you know, so, someone saying, well, you don't want monitoring, you want observability, or you say APM, application performance monitoring, and now you want observability, what's what's the difference? And, you know, I think about how very often it's very useful for um, our dashboards or for whatever else to kind of look at one metric that covers a lot of stuff. For example, you know, we kind of want to combine how fast we're loading, how many, you know, requests are we serving, serving, and is anybody seeing errors? You know, we want that in one number. Observability is kind of an attempt to do that as an organizational goal. Mm -hmm. Observability asks, hey, how fast can someone looking at a problem or a question come up with an explanation and a next step? Yeah. So, you know, the the classic, of course, is, you know, the service is is failing or or flopping or we have a bunch of complaints from users, everybody's reporting some problem. We know something's wrong. If we take from that time to the time that we understand what the problem is, that's our measure of observability. So, mm-hmm. so everything has, right, it has a certain amount of observability, right? I would say the only thing where you maybe have an observability score or what, you know, not a real score, but, you know, your observability is very, very poor is when stuff goes wrong and it keeps going wrong and you end up just resetting the service and then it works and you don't right. know why. <laughs> right. That's, you know, you may, you know, you might have a very, very poor observability situation, even if your resolution was relatively quick, right? Because yeah. You know, you have a black box inside your system, and, and you don't understand how it works. Now, now, um, do Relic can help with part of the observability picture, and obviously, monitoring is part of the observability picture, right? How well do you go in, see how your code is performing, and send that that metric back to some kind of data warehouse to say, hey, you know, show me how well we're, we're performing. That's part of the picture. Other stuff like a new interface actually affects observability, right? Because if you're struggling to click through you know, and see what's really going on, right? If you're if you're clicking through, you know, thousands of lines of CloudWatch logs or right. sitting there and trying to like write a regex to sort of try and maybe find a pattern in these logs, you may have all the monitoring in the world, right? You could add a log line to every single, you know, line of your Lambda code, right? So you have all the monitoring in the world, it's all there, but your observability is very poor because the time it takes you to actually figure out the problem is quite long. Um, and maybe you find maybe you have when you find the answer it's in great detail and super mm-hmm. interesting right but but the time it takes is, is is high so that's why when you pursue observability you have to have to think about everything from how data is being collected obviously how it's stored and how available it is but then also just how it's displayed in a way that that makes sense and can operate quickly 
All right. I do. Uh, I do remember when I worked a uh, help desk, a support desk, very, very, very long time ago. Uh, my favorite solution to everything was just reboot your machine. That always works yeah. really, really well. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't do that in the cloud quite as easily, especially with really large applications. I, I was doing um, like a practice for one of the AWS certs. And I noticed like one of the questions involves like how you might automate that on an EC2 instance. Like, <laughs> like well, I can answer that, but I, I hope that's not what's happening. Like, right. I hope you're not just saying like, well, you know, how would you automate rebooting every 24 hours to keep this like, what you know, who knows what from from affecting right. you? Right. Yeah. No, and I think it's interesting too. You, know, you mentioned uh, about making customers happy because that's one of those mm -hmm. things for me too, where uh, it, it's great if you can get some alarms. And I mean, you can set up CloudWatch alarms. You can even do some, you know, yeah. uh, some. You know, you can do some interesting tracing with things like X-ray and, like you said, CloudWatch insights. There's all kinds of things that can give you data. Um, but your ability to kind of pinpoint what's wrong and act on that data quickly, um, that's a big yeah. thing because, I mean, even if your reliability is really high and you have a lot of, you know, sort of nines up there, um, I think if you don't have that resiliency built in where you, you can yeah, keep customers the, happy, that's a big thing. Yeah, this is the charity majors thing. You know, charity majors puts it as you know, nines don't matter if your customers aren't happy. Right. And this is, you know, there's a couple ways to look at that. One is right, you know, you may have great observability, you may have great metrics for performance, but you're not really seeing errors that are happening. Another one that I see pretty frequently, and it, you know, I do get to talk about a neurotic feature I genuinely like, which is awesome, <laughs> which is, you know, um, way back in the days, one of my first development jobs, I was working for uh, an online like classroom system. Yeah. And a lot of our users were like homeschoolers or people with just two or three kids in their, in their little online classroom. And for them, the service always performed great. And they represented in all their usage, they represented, you know, no, none of the operating costs of the company. Mm -hmm. The operating costs of the company were represented by these people who often had 30, 40 kids in a room, but then often hundreds of kids in the same virtual classroom. Yeah. And for them, the interface performed very poorly. They were a much tinier percentage of daily page loads. So our average page loads were great. But what happened with well, the system that we had been, therefore created was once you really started to love our tool and give us a lot of money, we just gave you garbage. That was when we started to treat you very badly. Yeah. And that's just, you know, that's all the data that that was happening was there. But until you could facet that data by, for example, customer ID or even, God forbid, by sales size, by how much money that, you know, you have page load, sure. How much money does each page load represent in mm -hmm. revenue, right? right? And so that's something where, again, you can have great instrumentation and great metrics. And I mean, that's in, for example, that's in your CloudWatch metrics somewhere, right? You have all those parameters on every right. transaction in CloudWatch. But the question is, you know, how do you get to that point? The other, side, the other of side, of course, and this is the classic New Relic thing. And, you know, my my title is actually like I'm a dev advocate just for serverless, right? So mm -hmm. I'm very focused on the serverless stuff is beyond, okay, yes, here's how you're performing overall for whatever customer, right? Let's facet it or let's look at various metrics um, is, okay, how is this code inside of that actually performing? Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is an area where, again, whatever great, you know, AWS or, or Google Cloud or whatever built-in metrics, they're just going to tell you how long that virtual code execution environment ran, right? When did it start? When did it stop? It matters for billing. It matters for everything. Mm -hmm. But the why of it, right? Why are we hitting a problem here? You know, why are we not performing well for some users? Or maybe you're doing something really complex and you're emitting, you know, a user response halfway through your runtime. And so climbing runtime maybe isn't a problem because the second part is you're just cleaning up data or... You know, yeah, Josh knows. So for that, that's this thing, you know, APM, it may be a classic, but it's a classic for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Where you say, hey, I want to know how much time is sent, you know, say you're a node, how much time is sent inside the Express library and how much is my own code, right? Yeah. And these are questions that, 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 you know, you know, you want to have real instrumentation, right? A code level instrumentation. And ideally, you want to not have to sit there <laughs> and add a bunch of timing points and call points, you know, uh, adding observability, you really hope that it's not that your whole team can't ship features for two or three weeks while they go and add a bunch of code points, right? Right. So, yeah, New Relic, of course, got famous for doing this right out of the box. And New Relic Serverless offers a very similar performance where it will go in and it'll tell you, hey, this thing's running really long. Okay, why? It's this function call. 
right? That's the one that's taking so long. Or no, hey, all the all the Lambda code's running really fast, but it's sitting here waiting for the DB to come back for quite yeah. a while. And you can see that very easily. Right. So, I mean, in terms of adding observability to your mm -hmm. application, I mean, I remember back in the day, as you said earlier, where, you know, you could just install something on the server um, and then yeah. it would just start doing all that stuff for oh, you, this, right? Yeah, yeah, this is a really interesting area because there's some stuff when you go, when you set up to do this, that just doesn't make a ton of sense, right? You're just like, okay, you know, when something happens, it's maybe, you know, okay, you, you, you load some kind of wrapper and then you wrap, wrap the server with code, just as well as you can wrap any other code to say, okay, you know, kind of watch the function, maybe look for function calls and then, and then announce how, when something took a long time. Okay. Announce where, right? Cause you're, <laughs> you know, you're on the server environment, right? So you don't have an agent, right? There are things that just don't translate over like a, like a common call that I would write in, you know, explain to people a thousand times a, a week it, when I was in support was, you know, here's how you increment a metric, right? Mm -hmm. You say, you make a call to the new relic agent and you say, okay, increase whatever metric by one, you know, and sure. Maybe there were a few instances, the agent running on different servers, but they would take, you know, we could work that out, right? We could add that up, but that's not meaningful at all. There's no, there's no observer, <laughs> right? right? To get all those little requests on, on a serverless environment. And if you're doing something, um, Someone told me recently that I use the term naively in a way that's like, I don't mean it pejoratively, but it's not like, I just mean, you know, you're just trying something out as a prototype, right? And, and mm -hmm. prototype, say, instrumentation for Lambda might be, okay, when you get done running, don't just end, right? You've returned whatever you returned, return, 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 return your data somewhere, and then yeah. shut down, right? The problem is, I mean, the, the gift and the curse of, of serverless, right, is that it charges you by the second that that thing is running, or right. by the millisecond that that thing is mm -hmm. running. So if you just, oh, I just need to make a quick little call, well, you know, that could very easily, a lot of Lambda, Lambda's run for a very short period of time. So that could yeah. easily double or triple the runtime of, you know, so then your bill for Lambda's just shot up yeah. just, just, just to get observability. And that's not a great situation. You don't generally want to see your actual service costs shoot up to do yeah. observability. So, um, what the new relic agent does is it uh, uh, creates a wrapper, which is the same the same like uh, uh, code instrumentation that you see with our APM stuff. So if you're running a node Lambda, you'll get the same level of code instrumentation. Mm -hmm. But instead of trying to phone home every time it runs, it writes it out to CloudWatch and then uses another agent to to just snarf that up from every single one of your Lambdas. And so it's a very clean install experience and also has like very, very tiny overhead. So that, that's quite nice. Right, and then the performance of, of other things. I mean, you clearly know this with uh, with the way serverless works is that everything is so distributed, right? So you've got SQS queues, and you've yeah. got Event Bridge, and you've got DynamoDB, and you've got all these different things happening. Somebody uploads something into an S3 bucket, and that kicks off. So what what yeah. type of observability do you get with New Relic around those other components? Yeah, I mean, before we even talk about New Relic, this is such an important thing, and I, I'm guilty of it. I'm sure, I'm sure if you run the tape back, you'll you'll hear me do it here, where I say, "Oh yeah, serverless," and then I say, "Oh yeah, AWS Lambda," or maybe Google Cloud Functions, and I'm like, "Those are like almost that like those are synonyms, right? That yeah. Those are the same thing." In fact, right, you know, serverless, AWS Lambda is not particularly new, but it is still kind of new. But you know, the oldest and best thing from AWS, AWS S3, that's also serverless, right? right? You don't initialize your storage server there, right? You just give it the object and expect right. it to figure it out, right? And so, first of all, even the term serverless applies to a whole bunch of cloud services. And then also, no, you know, I, I say this all the time. I say, you know, who can tell me how to find your um, serverless functions IP address? Okay, 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 that was unfair. How do you find its URL? Right, you just want to go ahead yeah. and send it. You know, it's like, well, okay, it doesn't have those things, right? Exactly. You, you to, to even do that, you need to create an API gateway to to, to have a connection even to to your web. So, no no lambda exists in isolation, right? And of course, there's going to be at least even for you know anything beyond hello world, even for the to do list app, right? You're going to need you know, uh, a gateway, probably mm -hmm. some kind of file storage. Yeah. And then you're going to need some kind of database probably, right? So so it, it, one of the other things that I hear all the time when I talk to developers who are working with serverless is that maybe they understand how their code is working, but when they go and hit their API gateway and get a 500 back, they don't know where the problem is, right? right. Is it permissions between components? Is it the Lambda code? Is it the database is returning something wrong? It's just not obvious, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so, um, you 
AWS is sort of their their in house solution to that is X Ray, which is which is an effort to say, hey, let's see how what what one request did all the way end to end, right? Mm-hmm. To give you that insight into saying, hey, let's let's see how this started, uh, you know, starting again, and and and, and and what services it hit in between. So you might have some surprises there that you say, hey, I didn't realize this is relying on this other maybe queuing system, or it, it, it's you know this lambda always calls this other one. Well. There's a problem with what I just said, always, right? right? Where X-ray is just a little sampling of, you know, hey, this is right. what one of these did. And very often you'll be in the situation with X-ray where you'll say, hey, um, all my all my X-ray traces are pointing to the same problem, but they're it's tracing only when something's like going wrong, mm-hmm. you know, or it's tracing only a certain situation. So other stuff you're not seeing. So um and they really, first of all, we do instrumentation on every single invocation. It's not sampled. You actually see every single invocation yeah. and what those like code spans were inside of each invocation. And then we also integrate with X-ray data. So we pull X-ray data into our distributed tracing system to help you look at it in a unified place. And obviously, those are going to be sampled. We're not going to send you, you know, every single span for every single item because that would be a good uh, a very wild amount of data, but it is going to give you a really even sampling that shows you really broadly across your stack what's going on inside, inside of those stacks. And yeah. then you can sit there and see, you know, just like we've been talking about, like, hey, this much DB time, or these are the other services that were called. Yeah. And I think that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, but I, I was just going to say, I, I think that's interesting too, where you're sampling everything. Uh, and, and I don't know if mm-hmm. you say sampling everything, you're just recording everything. And and part of the idea behind that, and this is something I talked with uh, actually Erica Windish about uh, a couple of weeks of, uh, a couple of weeks ago on the yeah. show. Uh, we were talking about how it's sort of really interesting where it's almost like you want to be able to see when your application is behaving correctly like that's some of what you Mm -hmm. want to be able to see um because then you can do things like performance tweaking and you can say okay the service is running just fine but this lambda function is taking 600 milliseconds to execute why is that and you can dig down and you can do some optimizations some of the best leadership i ever got was um i I had a an engineering manager um i'm blanking on her name Uh, embarrassing anyway (laughs) um i'll I'll remember it and shout it in the middle of the later i promise but um you know, she said, you know, we're hunting down these errors, but let's just sit down and look at our total number of requests and the number of errors here. Right. And, you know, if we're erroring at one kind of request every time, then, yeah, we have a, we have a systemic problem. But, Absolutely. you know, maybe it's a timeout or something else. And if it's, you know, one half of 1%, maybe we should go looking, looking at one thing to the right and seeing yeah. how we can improve that experience. Right. You know, um, in, in that case, we have, like, some little, you know, user response section where they're supposed to put in, like, a percentage. And everybody was taking a minute or something to get through that. And mm-hmm. so we really had a user experience problem, right? For all users that we wanted to look at that was much more important than like once in a while when people put, you know, unescaped SQL into their username, then it would air. Okay, great. Right. But that really wasn't, you know, that wasn't the problem that most users were having. So yeah, you want to capture data when things are going right. That's a that's a that's a very smart thing that to, to to sort of keep in mind. Um, Awesome. And obviously that's all doable in the serverless world, though there are these situations, right? And and this is the thing where distributed tracing becomes a big issue where in some serverless tools, right, you can write some code and you can go in and, 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 and get real insight. And in, in Lambdas, you can even use layers to, you know, grab big, large code packages and say, I want to use this sort of outside my, my code. In others, you can do some configuration to say, hey, please log this over here and try to watch those logs. Yeah, but in others like queuing services, you can't do any of that, right? Mm-hmm. So if that queuing service experiences an error, like, right, where does that go? Or especially, especially, hey, when things are going right, like, how long does it take you to dequeue certain stuff? Well, there's no endpoint to say, hey, you know, queuing service, I want you to tell me about this. So that's yeah. why stuff like X-ray integration is super key mm-hmm. because you have to figure out. You have to get insight into those things that, by design, don't allow you to do any kind of that. You know, you, there's no custom code you can run around the simple cubic service. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I like I like the idea too of trying to connect things automatically with tracing headers and correlation mm-hmm. IDs and some of that stuff that you do not want to have to try to deal with yourself. And I know it's not perfect yet. I know it's 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 getting yeah. there, but we're, um, we're actually like we're still sweating the AWS people to be like we want to we want to implement like some more open standards for right. for, for this kind of tracing headers because. Right. We're trying to we're trying to get to the point where it's a little bit easier. It's such a common request, and of course I understand it to say, 
you know, I need to connect all this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I don't just want to be sitting here looking at, you know, here's how all your DV calls performed. And then over here is how all this queuing stuff performed. Like I want to be able to see these together. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So let's talk about the new Relic 1 platform for a minute because oh, yeah. I, I do think there are some really interesting things in here. And um, and I'll, I'll read off the website right now, but essentially it's one platform, three products. And I, I, I think mm. that's interesting because and we're going to get into a little bit more about this, but maybe we can just talk about each one of these things. So the first one is the telemetry data platform. So what what's that all yeah. about? So, you know, we haven't gotten to talk much about open source, which is which is partly a focus for me and it's certainly a focus for the, the the entire company. And and you know, one of the things that we're seeing, especially since I was, you know, last you know, since 2015, is that um, you've seen a lot of great open tools to do some of the instrumentation that you need. Now, I, I'll I'll be honest, in my experience, right, if you install a new relic APM agent, you're gonna get really detailed information about mm -hmm. function calls, their names, their designations, right? But there are some open tools that can do, uh, you know, similar or, or close to that performance. But also there's open instrumentation for stuff that we, of course, never got to writing instrumentation right. for, right? So open instrumentation is a huge, huge component. There was a tool initially called Open Census for PHP, but it's it's now, I believe, called Open Telemetry. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you get great results with that. Now, where does that data go? Right, it's great to have a platform for that instrumentation, but if you're then saying, okay, well now we got to stand up a database, and now we got to stand up a data front end to show people right. what's in that database, right? You just, you know, you said, oh, we, we used open tools, but we just put ourselves in a difficult situation. Right. So the telemetry data platform, you know, uh, is an attempt to be this omnivore for that performance data, and have a place where those open source tools have a home where they can send data and display it in a really clean and useful way so that your, you know, um, maybe like sales enablement people or other people who have, you know, coding skills and, and want to write, they want to write a SQL query to, to, to show you the data, mm -hmm. but they don't want to sit there and configure your database themselves. They don't want right. to, you know, handle database permissions. They just want to write a few lines of SQL and get a cool chart, right? So, the telemetry data platform is a place that you can send that data and and pull it out in a really effective way. And hopefully yeah. that helps your observability. I would hope so, because I don't think anybody wants to be setting up databases just to store telemetry data. Yeah, like that's, I mean, that's, yeah. that's the thing is like, you know, you have a hard enough time running your own databases for like customer data. Right? Exactly. Like, you know, you yeah. sort of get to this, you know, meta point where you're like, yeah, I don't want to be setting up services to observe the services that observe the services. Right. right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the other thing. Right now, you're going to observe your database platform in order to make sure that that's that that's still up and running. Which, I mean, if you think about just the promise of serverless or the idea of serverless in general, yeah. it's hand off that undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, collecting telemetry data is probably something you don't want to try to manage yeah, yourself. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it, that, that is actually something I love about. Yeah, I love about working at Stackery, and I love seeing it, of course, as a as a value at New Relic, which is, you know, this whole serverless ethos, right? Is you're supposed to be focusing on business problems, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're sitting there and saying, you know, I got to learn this config value because, you know, one of my one of my Kubernetes clusters <laughs> failed, and I got to learn this because, again, you know, it's like, well, okay, well, you know, how did this help the customer? It's like, well, the service is back up, so I suppose that's good, right? right. But you know. The idea is you're supposed to be saying, hey, I didn't, I don't think we're going to differentiate on becoming a platform company, right? And I think again, saying, hey, we're the best at measuring our perform, or measuring our own performance, our own service mm -hmm. performance. Like we have people here who are great at, at engineering an observability platform. It's unlikely that that's what's going to differentiate you if your job is to, if you want to be selling shoes online, right? So, so, so New Relic can handle a lot of that, that heavy lifting, right? Mm -hmm. And present an incredibly clean and incredibly cheap in my in my in my opinion I'm not a salesperson I'm not you know deep on these sales numbers but you know we can pre present something very very inexpensive to, to store and retrieve that data so then the second piece is full stack observability and that's very much like that's that's the stuff that um, you know uh, it, it's what you sort of know and love about new relic but you know very often I will I will be interested and say hey you know I'm Dev advocate in serverless for New Relic, and people sort of be like, "What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Doesn't New Relic just do APM?" And it's like, oh, yeah, well, right. we, we still do, and we're the best at that." But also, yeah, like we'll observe your serverless stack super good. So you know, this is this is the stuff that we're very familiar with, right? Is that you get this really deep insight into what you're doing. It's kind of what we've been talking about. So right. maybe there's less to say about that that piece. But then the last piece is is AI stuff, and mm -hmm. you know, the when when I try to explain internal to New Relic. 
like why this is important or why we should, you know, take the time to document this or that or talk about it. As I say, you know, I've been doing, so when did I come on and run and run was like 2012? People used to say to me in 2012, they said, you know, you have all our data. Why do I have to set up the alerts? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I have something that sees 10,000 requests a minute and yesterday it saw six yeah. all day. Why can't you just why why can't you just email me you know right. and, and no and you know I have been hearing I heard about it in 2012 I'm old <laughs> I heard about it you know the year after the year after I and then uh, you know on a call with a customer who was a very advanced customer of ours using a lot of beta features I heard an engineer say it again they said you have all our data why do, why can't you see hey you know it, it, why couldn't you maybe even message us when errors are normally at 10% for the service because maybe right. you know, user behavior creates an error and now they're suddenly at 0%. Why couldn't you email us about that? Because it's it's just so, so unusual. And right. another engineer at that company on the call said, yeah, we actually have that. Let's go look at the Slack channel. Yeah. And the Slack channel was just, hey, this error rate dropped. Un I mean, that, you know, this throughput dropped unusually low today. Yeah. And if you click through and you can go see the right chart. chart. Yeah. That's pretty cool, right? Like that, that has real promise. And, you know, there are, of course, you know, as with any like ML system or any linear algebra system, like there are times when many times when it presents you things that maybe you don't, you know, you care about. Right. But just like with any well-engineered system, you can go back and say, hey, I don't, you know, I want to see less of these. I want to see more of that. And right. often, you know, obviously there's a huge place for, you know, manual learning. It's something I talk about all the time. But yeah, it can be very, very powerful. Yeah, and I think I think the idea of you know even simple anomaly detection, right? Like when you have mm -hmm. data that's collected over time, and you can see that like your average error rate or your average throughput or whatever, and then also not like. Um, uh, sort of the the cheap um, anomaly detection where you say, oh, well, it averages this. Like, well, averages are great, but only for certain periods of time. Like maybe in the morning yeah. it's higher. Maybe in the afternoon it's lower. Maybe we get a spike at lunchtime or whatever it is. Um, yeah, or like you're selling it, delivery food and you're getting just a, a sort of simple average. You're going to get an open three times a day, right? Right. It says, oh, yeah. my God, or at least <laughs> twice a day. I don't know. People get delivery breakfast. I don't Let's know. Let's not maybe. talk about that now. But, <laughs> but yeah, at least, at least at lunch and dinner. It's a, you know it can't be a simple thing, right? It, it right. really needs to be at least a second order system that can say, yeah, you, for example, hopefully, right? Hey, you normally see a spike at lunchtime, and maybe you can go and say, oh well, it's Christmas Day, so okay, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's, right? That's it's Thanksgiving, so it makes sense. Not that people are going to order a pizza right now, you know, but uh, but yeah, you know, you, you want that kind of at least a second order system that says, yeah. hey, it's not just the average, it's not just that you're breaking the average, but that. Um, something does seem off here. Yeah. yeah. And I think the promise of AI and machine learning and all this kind of stuff, it's kind of funny because I think we're, tr we're finally starting to see people implementing real um, AI slash ML use cases. I, I think when you, you know, in 2012, because I'm also old, um, you know, I remember every pitch deck having, oh, we do ML and AI with no idea what that even meant. Um, yeah. But I think if we go back to the conversation we were having earlier about observing your application when it is working, that this yeah. is the kind of thing where AI can really help. Because if you're not getting any errors, but you are just seeing a huge slowdown for your lunchtime order spike, um, then there mm -hmm. is a good reason to potentially go and look at that. Like there could be a reason why that's slowing down, right? I mean, especially like what if all of a sudden your traffic dropped off, um, but everything seems to be working correctly, you know, that, that gives you insights where you can go and start investigating those other things. So it's not just about errors. It's also about just, you know, fluctuations in the normal operation of things. Yeah. And that's actually, it's something I talk about a lot that I, I would argue, this is maybe a little extreme to actually implement, but that everything you're setting a high alert for, you want to think about, it, would it be meaningful to set a low alert for? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now it might be, and, and I think that some of the things that seem obviously like would be obvious no's, like total response time. I think that might make sense. Maybe it's a very, very low threshold, but you say, hey, you know, uh, we're, we're reporting that your total runtime for your lambdas is 0.01 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. like, something is wrong yeah, at that right. point, right? You know <laughs> that something is wrong. So um, obviously high and low throughput are, are classics, but another one um, is uh, that, that covers a lot of these is actually low cost. Like yeah. if your costs just suddenly drop, drop by 30, 40%, 
something's probably unless you really did just push out a big release something's yeah, probably right. up um and so that's that's something that i think is really really interesting as far as you really can you know when you're thinking about a crisis that is something that is not what you have predicted you know mm -hmm. something again we talked about charity majors before but something i really thought about a lot the that stuck with me is how um very often we create dashboards for problems that we've agreed we're not going to fix yeah um and that's something like you know you have a huge system it leaks memory sometimes yeah and you really just need to watch memory usage and reset some, reset the thing right. and, and you you and, and i don't think anyone would disagree with that so yeah this is a dashboard to, to monitor a problem that we're not going to fix or like right you know whatever you got a steam locomotive it gets hot right like yeah. you're not like you're not you're sitting there trying to make a cold steam locomotive you're just saying hey yeah it gets hot so we need to keep an eye on that right right so um but then those are all the problems that you know about right so hopefully anomaly detection and some other observability tools can get you to a point where you at least you get at least a clue right it's not that yeah. you can you know not that you're getting a text that says you know hey you know steve just uh you know deployed some code and it used an incorrect sorting algorithm and that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what you're gonna get on your phone right you just yeah. get an indicator that says hey i should need to start looking into this and, and mm -hmm. see that there might be a problem yeah, no, and I, and you know, the other funny thing is too is that we've been talking about these metrics, and we we said like you know how long a function runs for, and mm -hmm. um, things like uh, you know uh, maybe I don't know uh, errors and things like that. And we're talking a lot about application sort of level things, right? I mean, I get there are certainly yeah. infrastructure components underneath that, but that's another great thing about servos too is you can start focusing on a different set of metrics, which are yeah. not is my server running? It's where is where are my performance issues? And that's I think that's yeah. just another thing that's really great about what you can do with observability. Yeah, something I'm, I I love diving into is. Um, you know, I'll just take people through, maybe they've done some of the New Relic instrumentation on their on parts of their like, cloud stack. And I'll say, hey, let's look at some of the parameters that you're gathering for every single invocation that right now we're not doing anything with. And they're just mm -hmm. be, you know, they're, they're, the, the, they're the event parameters are just available within AWS. And we'll step through them and, you know, there's there'll be often a lot there, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously there's stuff like the event source, where did this come from, you know, right. like, you know, did the API gateway call this thing? Was it was it event from someplace else, right? Um, and you can see, can see stuff like stuff that would make my heart stop. Where it's like sometimes this function is called by API gateway, sometimes it's being triggered by DynamoDB, and you're Which like is, the yeah. same function though. <laughs> <laughs> right, like that's not good. Seeing like cans of soup and balls of cotton on the conveyor yeah. belt, you're like, I don't think uh, this doesn't seem right, you know. But um, uh, you can really. Like there's often there's so much available on each of those events. They're very rich data objects mm -hmm. that you can start looking yeah into actual business logic where you can say, hey, let's look at you know how one organization or customer or one sort of use type like yeah. hey you know this is a person making some kind of update request right, and a lot of that stuff you know is available on the front end often right in front end monitoring. But I, I like to see that coming in more and more on the back end. So instead of, yeah, just looking at kind of, you know, I, I, I often sort of that thing, but I think of it as like these engine metaphors where you're sort of seeing, oh, the engine's hot, the engine's cold. It's like how much memory are we using mm -hmm. physically? How hot is the CPU, right? Gets you to the point of saying, no, you know, this service is very critical for people updating their accounts and see how that's taking longer or that's performing right. differently, you know, and let's look at what that might mean, right? right. Um, something I, I think about is like uh, looking at the, the rate of DB information that's coming back, yeah, right? Because um, one of my one of my side things is looking at GraphQL and trying to encourage people to do these, you know, fully parameterized queries, right? Is, mm -hmm. uh, hey, look at how you know, this kind of request, we're always sending, you know, we're sending half a megabyte back every time someone right. tries to do this one thing. And, you know, that's, that can be, that can be very, very insightful. And again, that's much more in the business logic world than it is in the world of just sort of, yeah, as you say, like looking how the server is doing, is the right. server up or down? Exactly, exactly. So you mentioned cost in there too. And, um, mm -hmm. and of course, when you're using, um, when you're using on-demand or pay-per-use services, especially in the serverless world, I mean, even in cloud in general, um, you know, cost yeah. is one of those sort of first-class metrics. And um, you know, we could yeah, talk it's more kind of about fascinating. So, sorry, to, sorry, to, but, but I, I'm studying for the cert right now and looking at the, the, you know, there's whole classes of AWS stuff that exists because some of the tools you're using only do host-based pricing. 
and right. you're like, oh, you have, I mean, not not to the point of, like, Lambdas can't do that, right? You can't say, like, oh, I own these cores. But, like, with EC2, people are like, oh, I need to own certain cores because that's exactly how I pay. I pay by, like, core ID. <laughs> yeah. It's like, wow, that's, that sounds pretty old, right? Exactly. You know, like, yeah. if I'm going to do, if I'm paying for my Lambdas by how many requests I get, and it's, you know, the billing is scaling smoothly, mm -hmm. shouldn't that happen for everything that works with it, right? right. So, so that's been, it's been nice to see that. Again, I, you know, I'm not, I, I'll connect you with great sales and ailment people who tell you all about like the exact cost structure, but it is nice yeah. to see, hey, we're doing usage-based pricing, which is very helpful. For me, the part that I'm super passionate about is I love going and talking to like boot campers and, and yeah. new people. I do a Twitch stream that's just for people who are like totally new with AWS. It's like, hey, let's get your first web app on AWS, let's get you the hello world. And there's a, such a weird thing about observability. Observability is this buzzword very much like you know, test-driven development was or yep. object-oriented programming or anything that's like, hey, this is good. You, know, you do this is good. But, you know, if someone was trying to pitch test-driven development and they said, you know, well, what's step one? Well, step one, you sign an $800 a month contract, right? <laughs> right. You know, step one, you at least $20,000 in sales you have to sign up for. You know, it's like, yeah. and, 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 you know, most of the tools for observability, they're not cheap, mm -hmm. you know? And so... Yep. This thing is called the perpetual free tier. And, and again, like I'm not going to break it down into gigabytes and MIPS and MOPS, but I will say <laughs> if you're running a little hobbyist app or, or you know, for me, I'll be setting up like e-commerce apps for people. And, and you know, I just kind of want to set it and, and not really think about it. That perpetual free tier is, is that will just carry you, right? That yeah. will gather plenty of data, plenty of usages, plenty of requests. If you have a, a few hundred, hundred or a thousand users, you can use that free tier forever, top into New Relic and see how the service is performing. So that's so nice for me because when I started five months ago, it was like, mm -hmm. well, you know, I can sign a bunch of boot campers up for a free trial. And then in, you know, two and a half weeks, they're just going to be yeah. out of luck. And so yeah. that's, that's been really nice. I, you know, I think there's a real power in that, in the idea that just like testing, it's not that necessarily every single person is going to do it, but it's much more about if you take the time to do it, there is a service available that is that is affordable, right? Yeah. Or like, you know, I, when I started learning web development, you know, a lot of people were, they'd gone pretty far, but they were doing all their hosting on their laptop, right? right. Because they, they could not go out and just buy hosting, right? Yeah. So that's what New Relic is trying to do with observability is say, you know, it, it, it either costs you nothing or it costs something is just very, very negligible on top of launching your business or launching your, you know, web web work. Right. Yeah. And I mean, and the, the free tier is, I mean, I don't want to get into the numbers, but you're right. The free tier is very generous. It is a, there's quite a bit that you can do um, in that free tier and you couple yeah. that with the, the free tier with like AWS and uh, you could probably run a good size application for quite some time before you start getting hit with charges. Yeah. It was something that it was like, it was like, it was like in the millions of transactions you can be measuring. And you're still on the free tier. I was a yeah, like, hundred, a hundred million app transactions per month. And a hundred gigabit, uh, gigabytes of data transfer per month, which is pretty, yeah. pretty big. Yeah. Then yeah. So 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 you're right. Like it's also you know the other. Of course, I love talking to small teams or agencies and stuff. And agencies is a big one where I think about where it's like you know you would like to set up some observability tools on there so that when the client calls you six months later and says, hey, you know, we have some problem, you're not having to say, well, we got to start billing to even try and figure out what's up. Right. right. It'd be nice to click to do a dashboard. But then I also don't want to be bugging them about a $25 bill that has to be paid, right. you know, so that we can keep up the observability. So, yeah, that's pretty powerful. That, that, yeah. that I think is, it really opens up who I get to talk to, which is fun, because yeah. that means I can go and talk about Arduino stuff or talk about goofy CLI stuff, yeah. uh, you know, instead of instead of having to have these enterprise conversations. Right. And trying to sell people on that stuff too. Yeah. So, I mean, I think yeah. what's really great is again, not only do you get the free tier after that, again, it is, uh, it is usage based pricing. And, and mm -hmm. one of the things I love about that, cause just, I remember, uh, I started a, a startup back in 2010 at one point, uh, and we were building facial recognition as a part of what we did. And I had to go and buy a software that then I had to write a PHP, um, shared object for, or the uh, shared object module um, and write that so that we could tap into that with a with a PHP call um, in order to run facial recognition. 
I think it was mm -hmm. like $5,000 just to buy the software for that, plus all the engineering time, things like that. This is what I love about serverless and, and this idea of usage-based pricing where you just mm -hmm. say, hey, I need to run facial recognition. I can hit um, you know, AWS recognition servers or something like that. I need to translate a document or I need to do that. Mm -hmm. I just hit this one thing and it cost me a few pennies here and there. Um, extending that idea to something like observability, I think, is, uh, is amazing. It's very, very yeah, useful and, for those small teams. And it's so much this thing, you know, every, of course, everybody uh, often... When people ask me to define um, serverless, I say, you know, it, it's a goal. It's a goal like Agile, right? Like, mm -hmm. you don't you don't buy Agile in a box, right? You right. don't say, oh, well, you know, because we're all you know, clicking through this Kanban board 20 times a day. Well, now, now we're Agile, right? <laughs> and actually, one of the ways that it really is related is, is here, right? The ability to say, you know, a, a Slack's the classic example. It's like, hey, we have something here, and we think it could really be big, right? Well, well, well that's, great. that's great, but, you know, before you, you you get that huge interest and have those huge sales and have that huge growth, how can you make something that still performs well, that does something sophisticated, that lets you just say, okay, this one was successful and these 12 were not, right? Yeah. Uh, and lets you just scale with the success of that product, right? And serverless is so much about that. And I, you know, I tell people all the time to say, hey, just write this microservice serverlessly because very often, you know, you're an engineer, you have a good idea. You don't want to start with having a conversation about how you need to pay this extra AWS bill or you need to do this extra thing. Yeah. And it's quite wild. You can see people who make, you know, they're taking home 12 grand a month and they're having a conversation about an $80 a month bill that's taking 15 emails to justify yeah. like, and very often I see teams where the real message they take back after that is, don't experiment, right? By me asking you all these questions, right, you know not to experiment. Now you can say, hey, you know, you start this out, it's free or it's very inexpensive. And then yep. you say, oh, hey, we got a big bill we got to pay because we're taking off, right? Exactly. Tons of use. People love this area of the site, right? right? Maybe you want to add, you know, like facial recognition, you know, image recognition is a good one. Or say you want to add image editing, you want to add video uploading, and you mm -hmm. just don't know how big it's going to be, right? S3, S3 and Wabas are a very powerful way to do that, right? Using something like using you know serverless based video pre processing and then mm -hmm. and then storing in S three, if nobody uses it, you don't pay very much for that right. hosting. Right. Yeah. No. I always as I always suggest that too, where I say, look at start with start with serverless, um, especially from the prototyping phase. Mm -hmm. And if something gets so amazingly big that for some reason you can't optimize it anymore with serverless, and you have to yeah. you know go down as you said the Kubernetes cluster you know a path yeah. or something like that, then that's great. But you don't need to do that when you've got ten users. You need to do that maybe when you have yeah. you know ten thousand users or more. And a big part of that is what expertise are you building on your team? Exactly. You know, the, when you're using any observability tool, and and, and much like uh, you know deployment tools, I often say like, hey, go use an observability tool, right? Mm -hmm. Go use Grafana, right? You know that's that that's a that's a great open source toolkit, right? Just do something because what you want to build in your team is expertise at building your product, and yeah. and and observability should give you insight into your product. You really shouldn't be building expertise in other stuff, right? Totally. If you, if you say, hey, I'm becoming an expert in running a metric server in doing my CI CD config, like, well, you know, some of that stuff is ne may, may be necessary in certain use cases, but ideally, right, you're becoming an expert in your actual product that you're giving you what you want, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think about how, uh, you know, every time I try to struggle with the uh, time zones and time spans, <laughs> I think how, like, oh, boy, uh, the ladies at Airbnb must be so good at this by this point. They're probably, you know, they, they probably got a team that's like, yep, you know, right. how many fortnights between Memorial Day and Labor Day in <laughs> yeah. Canada or whatever, you know, like they got that. They got all that yeah. down, you know. Totally, totally agree. Um, all right, so let's talk about open source for a second. So you mentioned mm -hmm. open source a little bit in the beginning, things like Open Telemetry and some of those other services. Um, but yeah. you've gone, uh, or New Relic has gone all open source on all their yeah. their agents. This has been very exciting. Yeah, yeah. So this is something that I think you know was maybe overdue. It's probably overdue everywhere. Is that you know if you're using this tool to get insight into your own code, it seems nice if you could actually look into what it's doing. Right. Right. Um, and then also, of course, you know. Any instrumentation package, even New Relic's great instrumentation packages for all these different language web apps, um, you're going to want to extend it, right? And and most of the conversations I have when I talk to customers is about extending it in some way. And so 
through this, uh, you know, through open sourcing our agents, we've, we've opened a lot of that up to say, you can take a look at this logic, you can look at where it could be extended as, as is appropriate for your, your tool set. And then a big piece of that is a, a, a we're doing a ton of uh, contributions to the open telemetry project, previously open census, which I, mm -hmm. I can't remember if I slipped and called it open <laughs> census to start, but yeah. Um, to support, support yeah. again, you know, New Relic does great out of the box instrumentation, but of course the open source community is going to build instrumentation for stuff that we just are, isn't even on our radar, right? right? There's a new web framework every week, right? So if someone's going to sit down and write some great deno instrumentation, it would be great if they weren't doing that for just their own shop, right? Yeah. That was something that was shared everywhere, right? So, um, yeah, so so that's a, a big push, and, and I, I want to plug again: if you have an open source project and it contributes to observability and has a code of conduct in its repo, get in touch with me mm -hmm. because I would I, I would love for us to be backing that and, and helping build that. So the other big piece of that, and I mentioned a little bit when we talked about telemetry data platform, which is the name of the product, is you know um, if you're using an open source toolkit to do observation, we are going to be able to consume and display that that data in a very, very powerful way. So um, we really, this the, that part is not just this week, that's part that's been going on for a few months is, you know, or sorry, a couple of years is, you know, we've had really great endpoints to take that data in. And again, on this, you know, free tier, we can take and display a ton of that data without it really costing you anything to do that. Yeah. And even once you grow beyond that, it's not expensive. So that's a, that's a very powerful uh, set of tools to say, hey, maybe there is an open project that gives you a lot of the data you need, let, let, let us display that for you right in with the other stuff that we're instrumenting. Right. Yeah. And so besides just making the the agents open source, which I think you're right, I think is really exciting. Um, you're also mm -hmm. contributing quite a bit to open source. I think you're like the third most uh, you know, or the, the third biggest yeah, contributor I, uh, to open telemetry, I think. Right. Yeah. I saw that in the chat the other day. That's really neat. You know, obviously we have, you know, there, there's there's some engineers who have done you know, gone so deep on how to truly instrument certain behaviors and you know, do full instrumentation on some very, you know, big and complex applications uh, that it's really great to see those contributions becoming more open source and seeing that seeing that stuff happen. That's that's been really cool. And there's also um, there's some neat stuff happening with what we call programmability. This isn't this isn't my Bailey. There's a really smart guy, Jemaya, uh, on the team who um, he runs New Relic Nerd Days, which is uh, coming up in October mm -hmm. um, that we're all excited about. But um, you know, where people can also create whole modules inside of New Relic. So let's say you want to do, you know, you want to show our error rate or something. We want to do it in a fun way. You want to show it as a ring toss game, or you want to see, you know, an elephant that grows bigger and bigger for how many cars you sell or what have you. Um, I'm just thinking of visual ones, but whatever. Right, yeah. um, but we have an open source toolkit to do that so that you can actually build, you know, uh, data components. Now that's, that's after all your data is already in New Relic and, you know, you're sort of in the New Relic architecture. So it's not a great first project, but it is just fun to think about happening in the near future. Awesome. All right. So we've been talking a lot about the new Relic One platform, and we've talked quite a bit about serverless too, which is uh, uh, is I think most interesting to the people listening to this podcast. So mm -hmm. what like what are some of those features and and some of the things that you can do um, you know with new Relic when you when you plug it into your serverless applications? Oh yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great to talk about. It's sort of you know that's that's where I start. So. Um, the first piece is again is you're going to do a no no code commit deploy to do your instrumentation. So you're not going to have to edit your code. You're not going to have to add. You know, they always you know say this with some instrumentation like, Oh, just add a few lines of code right. to the top. <laughs> nope, not necessary. We'll do a tool, a tool layer, 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 and we're even working on better tools for that in the near future to deploy it in an even smoother way. Um, but then what you're going to get is again you're going to get that code level instrumentation on every single invocation. So you're going to be able to see. Um, at least for every single invocation, like for example, how much time was spent in library code, how much time was spent in your own code, how much time was spent waiting for a database or another server to come back. So that's significant. And then with our distributed tracing, you can be able to, to zoom in to a large number of your transactions and see exactly which functions were taking so long and what were they waiting for, right? Did you have maybe API calls going out from that? Were they, you know, you get this nice, um, I don't know what they call it, a waterfall chart or something. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> where you can see, you can see, hey, was this maybe happening synchronously? So it was really, yeah. you know, it was made asynchronously, but you were holding up other requests to wait on it. So, you know, you can see that that real detail. 
Um, there's other stuff too, which is just kind of quality of life stuff, but it, it really matters is you can see cold starts and you can see memory usage and the memory cap on your Lambdas. Mm -hmm. So very often that's critical. Sometimes it'll reveal a problem. I actually just was talking to somebody who sure enough, they had like tons of cold starts. And so they really did have to think about how they were going to handle that. But also it helps you eliminate that as a cause. Hey, you're seeing this you know, request time climb up. Do you need to dig into the tracing and the logging? Or can you just say, oh, look, it's cold starts, right? So uh, it's nice to be able to eliminate that. Using 50% using of memory, you're probably OK for CPU and I.O. as well. So you know, now we can move on to the, to the code performance. And then the last piece is, because we're using this kind of CloudWatch step, um, you can actually we have a Lambda sitting in your service that's grabbing that out of CloudWatch, grabbing that logging and sending it up to New Relic, which means we can actually grab more logs if you want. You can define a pattern and grab really extensive logs and send them up. And so New Relic logs is another way to connect those traces over and again, see really detailed performance information. All right. And you can actually add additional things. Like if you wanted to capture like specific business KPIs and things like that, mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. you you can alter your code and add some of that stuff in there, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can absolutely add stuff like uh, as a custom value. You also, again, because you get all the event parameters that, that AWS is sending around, mm -hmm. often that stuff is already in there. And we have right. this really clean data explorer where, you know, that's, that's a, that's a big stumbling log I've noticed for myself as well. Right. I'll say, oh, well, let me just log out this whole event and maybe it'll, okay, it'll log out, but it wasn't a complete object. So it'll be like a few ones. Right. I'm like, okay, I'm sure there's, that was, that's fine. I got enough detail, but just having a little explorer, you know, we have this thing called the data explorer where you can click through and be like, what parameters were available on this event mm -hmm. and are they on every other event right uh, does yeah. every event have a customer id or is it only some you know you can just see that and that just makes it so much easier to figure out what you might be charting or what you might need to do a code change to see. um that i've just seen that saves so many people so much time and so it, it's, it's always very nice to show off and right, that we can yeah. do that because we're doing that level of instrumentation on every single transaction mm -hmm. um you'll see it for every single invocation of your lambda so you'll get a really nice, consistent, smooth data graph on that. Right, and then you and then you get the benefit of the entire New Relic One platform. So you get the uh, the AI, um, you know, the AI monitoring there, and and the ability to do those alerts. But you can also set custom alerts if you wanted to as well. Mm -hmm. So you could see, for example, you can because you can do this right at the query level. So we you know we use a SQL syntax to to, to make all these charts. You can write a query that says, hey is my container running out of memory or are my lambdas running out of memory mm -hmm. and combine those together and get a unified alert for that. Now that one didn't make a ton of sense, but let's say, <laughs> let's say maybe you're using, you're, maybe you're using some kind of, um, you know, EC2 instance to handle some requests and you're yeah. using a lambda to handle other requests, but they're both, you know, check out cart actions, right? right? So you really want to unify an alert on that. You don't want to, you don't want to see it from one or the other. You want to alert everybody. And so, you can, because you're monitoring all this in one place, you can write an alert that, that covers both of those together, which is pretty nice. And obviously, even if you're not doing that combining of alerts, if you get an alert, you can very quickly click through and say, hey, you know, how's the Lambda side doing? How's our monolithic self-hosted application doing? You know, mm -hmm. uh, very consistently for me, you know, anybody who's really successful they have all those levels of abstraction exist, right? Maybe yeah. maybe they still own some bare metal someplace. They definitely yeah. have virtual machines. They have EC2 instances, and they have they have those those those. So being able to click around and see that stuff all together, oh, such a quality of life improvement. Right. Yeah, and I, I think you just actually made a really good point. I mean, this idea of having you know Lambda functions and EC2 functions running side by side. I mm -hmm. I don't know many companies that are a hundred percent serverless. I mean, I know a yeah. lot are going that way and they want to go that way. I know I would love to be a hundred percent serverless, but even some of my applications still have things that aren't serverless. And being able to yeah. put all of those into one platform is is really uh, is really powerful. Yeah, and especially as you see ML toolkits get bigger. I mean, there, there's ways to implement that stuff serverlessly, but I mean, it's not straightforward. So, right, right that's going to be a really big, good example where it's like, okay, we, we're doing all this basic, you know, CRUD action serverlessly. That's great. But then when we need to, you know, image recognition and put a fun mask over everybody's face because okay. it's, you know, St. Swivin's Day. Yeah, that's going to happen inside an EC2 instance. There's going to mm -hmm. be those exceptions, right? Yeah. Um, it's like when we talk about step functions or, or, you know, other stateful, you know, ways to do serverless. It's like, you know, oh, should I just do this from the start because I like using state? Someone's like, no, <laughs> but sometimes you get stuck. Sometimes you have to use right. those tools, right? right. Um, yeah, but the, uh, 
that's trying to get a picture of that whole map, right? That whole system quickly. That's hopefully that's where New Relic comes in. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, Nika, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk not only, well, not only about serverless, I mean, or not only about New Relic, but um, obviously uh, just your insight to serverless is is really exciting too and, and really interesting. And if people wanted to go and learn more about what you're doing with serverless, maybe some of your side projects, but also mm -hmm. New Relic, how do they how do they find out more about that? So, you know, uh, I'm still pretty bought in on, on Twitter. You can go follow me on TikTok too, if you go, go oh, search Nika Fee, you'll see, 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 see me over there. But most of my stuff is gonna go up on, on Twitter. I am on Twitch twice a week. I'm on on Tuesdays and Fridays um, okay. in the afternoon if you're a US Pacific time person. But um, I'll, I'll announce there. I do a lot of like hands-on demos there. Uh, but yeah, those are those are two great places. You also see me on the New Relic blog and various New Relic stuff. Um, I was just I was just quoted in Forbes this week. That was oh, wow. Yeah, that was neat. <laughs> That's it was awesome. about how you need to be able to throw stuff away in serverless. You need to be able to just say like the service is no longer running. You have to go through and delete stuff. Right. Right. That is a hard thing for some people to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I have you know I have games that I've written where. You know, in C sharp code where I have reams of lines that are yeah. commented out. It's just yeah. like I might need these someday. Someday, you know? I know. I always do that. Too. That's another bad they're, habit they're of mine. Like my but... old style Apple like, lightning connectors. Where I'm like, I right. just, I just you never know when that when that yeah. old iPod Mini is going to come in. Uh, you're going to need back. to charge it again. So, anyways, yeah. all right, Nika, thank you again. I will get all of this information to the show notes. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for listening. And that's this week's serverless chat. I want to give a huge thank you to Nika Fee for being my guest this week and to our episode sponsor, New Relic. If you want to check out the show notes and a full transcript of this episode, you can find them at serverlesschats.com slash 62. For more serverless chats, subscribe, sign up to be an insider, check us out on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can connect with me on Twitter, at Jeremy underscore daily. And if you want to keep up to date on everything serverless, make sure you subscribe to the Off by None newsletter at offbynone.io. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to chatting with all of you again next week.